So it is officially shop content season. We got our first snow of the year on Tuesday. Um, so we're taking a break from doing the West Virginia edits and we thought we'd bring you a fun suspension Saturday video. Yes. Suspension Saturday. Suspension Saturday. I think this will just be the start of a couple videos because there is a lot to cover. Um, yeah. It would be a long video and a lot to digest and understand. I just want to break it down in sections. And try and keep it interesting and fun and full of useful information. Yes. Um, so today we thought we'd address something that we encountered a lot on KRS forums and Facebook pages when we first bought these machines and we were kind of seeing what people do when they first buy them. Um, and the number one thing that came up, I think, was spring set. It was all over everywhere. Everyone said within the first 500 kilometers of owning this thing, it would say the arms would be level and that you had to do a aftermarket spring kit in order to fix this. Um, now we have two identical machines. They're both 2022 Herax 1000 Special Edition. Um, Steve has done a significant amount of suspension work. He has, the, he has a, a spring kit. Um, you have some caps on it, the nitrogen caps, I think. Um, done tons of Tuning, dobbing. Changed yeah. internal parts. Uh, IFPs have custom inside the shocks now. I've uh, played with a lot of things and I'm going on to my second or third spring kit now. I keep changing things. So I have a bit of experience to bring to the table to tell you guys from real world, not just I bought brand XYZ because 13 guys on Facebook said that that's the brand you have to buy. Yeah. And that's fine. If uh, Bob and Brian had a good experience with that spring and you want to run it, that's cool. I just want to bring you some more value to help educate your decision before you spend your money on that. Yes. Because there's a lot of places you can spend your money on these things. From bumper to bumper, you can mod them like crazy. So I just I find a lot of people make decisions without fully understanding all the options. Yes. So I just want to give you some data, some real world experience and some good data. Yeah. Um, and. He has a ton done to his. I have next to nothing done to mine. We have not changed the spring up, the springs on mine. No. Uh, he's done a little bit internal work and put the Schrader valves in. Yeah. Um, but that's it. That's the only thing that we've done on mine. And we wanted to keep it that way to kind of compare over time. Like we've had them for almost two years now. And we wanted to see if what people were saying was true or if there was a different way to do it. Um, and I think we have found some interesting things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we wrote down a list of things that we want to go over because we're probably going to forget as we go. So we're trying yeah. to we're trying to put this in an order and pack a lot of information into like a, a quick video for you guys. Um, so Mel's going to go behind the camera and I'm going to kind of go through each thing and explain to the best of my ability at this point in time. Yeah. No one knows everything. Uh, as life goes on, I'll learn more, I'll get smarter, and I'll have more information. But at this point, from all the knowledge that I have, this is the best I can give you guys, so I hope you find it useful. And with that, I think we can start going through the questions and answers and info and... Alright guys, so we're going to talk about springs here first. Springs are one of the most important things on the coilover, besides the stuff inside the coilover. So we're going to talk about what is the spring's job. So, at the end of the day, a spring's job is to store energy and return to its natural state. So its natural state is the free length of the spring. So the free length would be a spring with no load on it, just hanging out. So this one, 12 inches. That's a 12 inch spring. When you buy springs, they come in diameter, length, and pounds per inch of force to squish it. So every inch that you compress a spring takes a certain amount of pounds. Say it's 100 pounds, 200 pounds, 250 pounds. That's how they rate springs. Um, so when you're buying a spring, if you're buying a 250 pound spring, that is the amount of poundage it takes to squish it per inch. Correct. Cool. Yes. So every inch that that spring goes down, you add 250, 250, 250 as it gets compressed. On the so if you squish it three inches, it'd be 750 pounds Correct. that that load is seeing, of, that, or that, that spring is seeing of force. That spring is storing 750 pounds of energy and it wants to relax to its free length. Gotcha. So it wants to extend back. It never goes beyond its free length unless you were like pulling on it with hooks. It just wants to go to its natural state. Okay. So its job is to store energy. It's like a, 
a battery stores voltage. Okay. It's, it's a rate that's been specified by the type of spring steel, the diameter, the windings, the spaces in pounds per inch. You compress it, it stores it, and it wants to relax back cool. to its free energy state, just hanging it like that. Cool. And they rate them on those three things, diameter, length, poundage. Um, okay. So. so now you have, on a coilover, you have a main spring and a tender spring. Yes. So, so this would be, for an example purpose, this is our main spring, and this is our tender spring. So this would sit on top. And this is what we call our spring isolator. It isolates the two springs and it slides up and down on the shock body. Oh, okay. Um, so one of the big things we see on the KRX is, is the front shocks, they get rubbing on the shock body. That's from the spring isolator, which we can come back to that later when we're looking at the vehicle and talking more about it. But for this right now, we're talking about tender spring, main spring, isolator. Um, and then you're gonna have your tender spring rate, your main spring rate, and your combined spring rate. So there's actually three spring rates on a coilover. There's math involved, which I have written down on the paper here to try and go over it, just to give you guys some ideas of how this actually works. And then you will be adding preload and you will be setting your crossover nuts. All of these things work together. It's a package. It's not one thing or the other thing. And there's a lot of misinformation about that. So if we pan over to this paper here I have written down, let's go to this piece of paper right here if you zoom in on this corner. I don't know if that will. No. Yeah. Just gotta focus there. Okay. So you've got your front tender, your front main, your rear tender, and your rear main. These are all the factory KRX um, weights. So on the left, 250 pound, 300 pound, 150 pound, 250 pound, and then the lengths. So you've got your tender and your main, so it's a 250 over a 300. Now, if you do the formula, which I already did and I didn't write it on here, I'm just giving you the number at the end. The combined spring rate, if you were to go both springs before the isolator hits the crossovers. So if I take this isolator, I put it on this shock body. <laughs> Figuring out the camera here, sorry. Oh. Put it on the shock body and say you're at ride height right now and the isolator is hanging out right here and your tender and your main are on here. So you're going over little bumps, little bumps. That would be happening on that spring rate of 136 inches, uh, 136 pounds per inch. So it's taking 136 pounds of force to compress both of those springs equally until the isolator hits your crossover rings, oh. then you jump from 136 pounds per inch all the way up to 300 pounds because you've taken the tender spring out of the equation. It can no longer compress anymore because the isolators hit the crossover rings. So it's like taking that spring and removing it and that is now, your coilover is just the bottom part. So we do that to avoid having the shock bottom out too harshly but you don't want that to come on too soon because you're on that KRX factory spring setup, you are over doubling the spring rate. So you're going from 136 pounds per inch to compress it to 300 pounds of force per inch. So if it's the last couple inches of stroke, it's now taking 300 pounds every inch and that's multiplying up. So it's 300, 600, 900. As the spring compresses, it's taking more force. Like, it's a linear graph, or I guess it's... Yeah. Gonna, oh yeah, it's linear. It's going up, right? So it takes way more force. So you do that to avoid bottoming it out. But then you want to comfy your right at right height, so this is down here, and it's just sliding up and down, doing the combined rate. Now, there's a formula, but it doesn't matter. I have a big graph I got these off of, and that's how you get the 136. And then, that's on the front end. Then on the rear end on the Cowie, the combined rate is 94 pounds per inch. So it's a 150 over a 250. And that's probably gonna blow a lot of people's minds because everyone goes, well, the motor's in the back, the transmission's in the back. The back needs stiffer springs. It's gotta hold more weight. The crazy thing about coilovers and all suspension, it all comes down to geometry. And you look on that machine, if we walk over to the machine. So if you come over to the machine and you look at the front end on a Kawasaki, it's a double A-arm and the coilover is leaned in on like a 45 degree angle. 
So that shock, if you imagine this tire moving one inch up or one inch down, this shock doesn't move an inch. So the leverage that the springs are seeing is far greater than if we look at the back of the suspension and it's on like a 30 degree angle and it's on a long trailing arm, it's not on an air. So the leverage that this one is going to see is a lot less. Even though okay. you would think there's more weight on the back, we also have corner scales here and these KRXs are within 50 pounds of weight per corner. Oh. So they're a very balanced machine. So you're not worried about the weight of the machine, you're worried about the leverage that the shock is seeing while it's doing its job. Gotcha. So because there's less leverage on this shock, with the geometry of the arms and everything, they're running a softer combined spring rate on the rear. And looking at the numbers, I think even the main spring is softer. Also because of the lift. Yeah, it's a 250. So it's 50 pounds lighter than the front main. And that probably blows people's minds. They think the rear would have to have more spring, but it doesn't just because of the angles and the geometry that it's on. The cool. front has more spring. Cool. And then if we look at this other piece of paper, this is one of the most common companies on the market for selling springs. They don't give you their spring rates, but I can calculate spring rates in the shop here, so I've calculated them. So the factory uh, tender on the Cowie was 250 pounds. Theirs is 200. The factory main was 300 pounds. Theirs is 350. So they went softer tender, stiffer main. And then on the rear, they went stiffer tender, softer main. So, mm. and then combined, it was 136 factory. It's 127 with the new springs. So the front new springs are softer, excuse me, than the factory front springs. And on the rear, it went from 94 pounds to 106 pounds. So they went 10 pounds lighter in the front, 10 pounds stiffer in the rear. Hmm. It's minimal amounts of change. The bigger change is the tender to the main is going to act a lot different. Interesting. Uh, yeah, it is very interesting data when you look at that. And then you also look at the lengths. They went uh, a lot longer tenders and they added a lot more preload on theirs to get the same ride height. So they've done, they've done some interesting things, um, but talking about how to figure that out, I can go over and show you how I figure it out with the tools that we have here so that I'm not just throwing random numbers at you, you can understand. So we take our scales here, it's showing zero pounds of weight on it right now. It's just one scale. So this is a corner scale unit. We only have one turned on and I measure the free length. There's nothing on the shock right, or the spring right now. It's nine and a half inches long. And then we compress this down and you can see the numbers go up. Oh, cool. As we compress, so from all the guys that I've talked to and learned from, they always say go two inches and then divide the number by two. So it was at nine and a half, we're gonna go to seven and a half. The reason they say go to two inches is because at one inch, there's not enough load to be repeatable and consistent to trust the numbers as much. It works a lot better at two inches. So there's pretty much two inches. I'm just an eighth inch over and it's at 309, 310. So because I'm an eighth inch over, it's nine pounds over. That's a 300 pound spring. So that's a factory, or that's, sorry, it's 300 pounds at two inches. Divide that by two. That's a 150 pound spring. That's a factory KRX rear tender spring. Okay. So they have 150 pound and the aftermarket, I think on the piece of paper said 200. Pounds. Yeah. So they went 50 pounds stiffer on the tender and they went softer on the main. Okay. So I just want you guys to understand how they use these numbers to dictate what the vehicle does. So it's important numbers to understand because if you go through say Eibach, it's a massive spring company, they put the weights, the size, everything on their springs. So I have lots of them over. Here's an Eibach spring. This is a 14 inch long spring. It's a three inch diameter to fit over top of a two and a half inch shock. And it's a 150 pound spring. Oh, okay. But all the aftermarket guys paint over that so they won't tell you what their rates are unless you have a scale and you 
weigh it down and figure it out. And then you can compare it to the factory or to other aftermarkets. So yep. I have a whole bunch of data from a lot of different springs. It's, it's very important to know. Okay, Mel, ask your questions. <laughs> okay. As a, Mel doesn't really know, so I thought yeah. it'd be really good if she asked the questions. Yeah that I think other people are probably asking, yelling at the TV at home, going, well, what about this and what about that? And oh. I'm trying to give that information out. So she just asked a bunch of questions. So I'll ask them again. Okay, so he has this shock laid out. And we have the spring isolator here. You got your crossover rings here. And then you have the preload adjuster here. Yes. And I've never really understood the whole magic of how coilovers work. So what I was asking is, when you're riding on the isolator, but you're not hitting the crossover ring, are you riding on just the top tender spring? And you're not. And you're not. You're riding on both springs. Both yes. are compressing. And that's where this math, the combined, this number, combined comes in. number comes in. You're riding on 130, if this is a factory spring setup, you're riding on 136 pounds per inch. So it takes 136 pound bump or rut or rock or something of force to move this shock up an inch gotcha. compress the springs an inch so then i asked when the isolator hits the crossover ring does that mean that you are no longer using the top tender spring and that is correct cool once this, i know things once the slider hits this ring it's like removing this spring and taking your preload nuts and putting them on top of just this spring okay because that is basically like a secondary preload uh, pre nut. So then this is bottomed out and nothing is happening on the top side of it. Okay. So you're riding solely on this spring. And that's when you're going to jump from 136 pounds to 300 pounds. So it's gonna then take over twice the amount of effort to go another inch further. Gotcha. And every inch further, that's going up 300, 600, 900. It keeps going up to gotcha. avoid bottoming out. Okay. And then what I deferred from that was depending on where you set your crossover ring depends on how much of your tender spring you were going to use. Yes. Another yeah. way to say that would be depending on where you set your crossover rings is going to dictate how much travel you have on the soft 136 pound rate until it hits the isolator and then you jump to the 300. Pound. Gotcha. Same thing, okay. different way of saying it. Okay, cool. Yeah. You have so much travel with the tender and then it, as it compresses, this stops the tender and you go solely on your mainspring for the remainder of the compression stroke. So if you're like me and you never knew how these worked, now you do. Hopefully that clears it up a little <laughs> On bit. the spring side of it, there's a whole lot of magic Internal inside stuff. that happens that yes. I still... That's a whole other video. That's, yeah, that's a whole other, whole other thing. But hopefully that helps explain this whole spring situation a little bit better. Yes. And I think to piggyback on the isolator and the crossover ring, I think we could get into the preload ring. Yes. Okay, so preload. Preload. <laughs> It's a very weird subject when you get into the side-by-side -side world. I'm not gonna lie. When you're in the <laughs> off-road world, like ultra fours, race cars, Jeeps, even the race car scene, like I sponsor some circle track buddies of mine that are into those cars. They all talk about preload the same way. Then Mel and I got into this side-by-side -side <laughs> world and it's like, I don't even have words to explain how they explain preload, but it's weird. Anyways, <laughs> preload, how to measure it, and what it does, I think, would be probably the two main things. So in the side-by-side -side world, everyone just says, measure down from somewhere at the, they all say a different spot on the top of the shock, you measure down to your preload rings to the number that they tell you in their instructions. And that's how you measure your preload. That's so weird. The correct <laughs> way to measure preload is you take your free length of your spring. If it's a 12 inch spring, and you install them on your coilover, like this fully extended coilover, and you put these springs on, it's not in the vehicle, and then you thread the preload ring down so it touches on top of here, okay? And then it's all assembled, it's on the shock, but it's touching, that's zero preload. And from that point, you measure all, as you go down, you measure down how many inches of preload you are squishing this spring. So if it was 12 inches to start 
and the shock's fully extended and you thread that down and this goes to 11 inches and the shock is still fully extended, it's not in the car. That's one inch of preload on the shock. That makes sense to me. It has nothing to do with measuring from the top down in the vehicle or anything like that. It's just, it, I don't understand why they do that. And I even don't understand how a lot of the companies that I've seen send out springs and you spin these adjusters all the way to the very top, you slide the springs on the shock and the springs are already longer than the shock. So just to install the springs with what I would consider zero preload, they're already in preload. So the springs mm. are too long for the shock body to begin with. So even with the preload back so, all the way off, so what, they have preload. So what that means then is even when you're installing the springs on it, there's already downforce on the shock. Yeah, could be one inches, could be, I did a, a Maverick Sport for a customer and his springs free length were five inches longer than the shock at full extension. <laughs> and it was scary putting them on and talking with the company, three emails, phone calls, back and forth. The customer talked to them. They thought, we thought we had the wrong part numbers. They weren't the right springs. And they're like, no, we insist. They are correct. They are the right. He put them in the car, couldn't even drive it. Jeez. Cause say it's a, say it's a hundred pound spring. That's all the way to the top. And the spring is five inches longer than the shock at full extension. That means at, Full extension before you've even put the weight of the car on the vehicle the spring already has 500 pounds of force inside it and then you set the car down and the shock compresses say another three inches so now you're at what 800 pounds of force at ride height so as soon as you went and hit a bump it just shot the shock out fully to just like unloaded and rebounded and rode mm. like crap because the springs are way too long and okay. then they just tell you oh no they're right they're the, we're the best yeah. <laughs> that system just didn't work. So piggybacking on that subject, the SAG and why people are buying spring kits, let's roll right into the next thing would be nitrogen. I have argued with people on social media, so I gave up arguing because as the old saying goes, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You can believe whatever you want to believe. I know the information that's in my brain based on facts of actually doing it. So a huge misconception that's on the world of social media is that these coilovers on all these UTVs or side-by-sides, they've got nitrogen inside this reservoir, okay? There's a piston inside here that separates the gas from the oil. So everyone says, oh, your factory tender springs are too soft. So this right here, is the factory Kawasaki front tender spring. This is one of the most known aftermarket tender springs. If you shop a lot, you'll know who's their silver. It's pretty easy. So, if the aftermarket spring solves the issue because it's a stiffer spring, right? That's what everyone tells me, right? Yeah. It's a bigger, stiffer spring. These are too soft. They're too weak. They can't do the job. Well, let's look at the data. <laughs> the factory tender spring is a 250 inch pound spring that is 6.5 inches long. That's this spring that goes with that sheet. This sheet, I scaled this spring. It scales out at 200 inch pounds and it is a 12 inch spring. So this spring is 50 pounds softer spring rate than the factory spring, hmm. but it is twice the length. It is a 12 inch, this is a six and a half. Okay. So, if what everyone says is true, aftermarket springs are stiffer and they solve your spring sag. Well, numbers don't lie. That's a softer spring, yeah. like 50 pounds, yeah. which is a pretty big jump. So, back to preload, if I'm understanding this correctly, when you're installing this spring as your tender spring on the KRX, you're gonna have to put way more preload on that than you will this one. So you'll end up with a bunch more stored energy already than having this spring on it. That is correct. Oh wow, I'm learning things. That is 100% correct. Good. Yes. Good. That's so, right. so is that beneficial in any way? Um, that depends on what you're trying to do with the vehicle. Ha. Huh. You can make these things ride a whole lot of different ways. So I don't think we were talking about it on this 
vlog or video, but we talked about it before during dinner. You don't like how mine rides and mine yes. is running, was running this company's spring kit. Yeah. And now that you're understanding shocks, you're understanding why you don't like it. Yes. If you have longer springs that are softer with more preload to achieve the same ride height as a stock spring that is stiffer, you're going to have a lot more body roll in the vehicle. Mm. To achieve the exact same amount of ride height, it's a softer, looser, floppier feeling. Mm -hmm. That comes down to the other conversation we had where shock tuning is 100% subjective to the person who's riding in it or doing the tuning. So Fair. if the guys at this company thought that this was the best ride possible in that machine, it's because that's their opinion. Yep. You got in and said, this is floppy compared to the factory yeah. setup with the exact same valving internally in the two cars. Cause yes. I valved both of them the same the first go around. Now I've started changing things yet again, yeah. but they were twins. One's on stock springs, one's on aftermarket springs. The aftermarket springs are Stif softer in the front, stiffer in the rear, but because of that, they had way different amounts of preload on both cars and they handled a lot differently. Mm -hmm. And you're not a shock person and you felt it right away. Oh God, yeah. So it's important information to understand. Yeah. The numbers don't lie. It's not an opinion, it's an actual number. It's been on a scale, it's been measured. Mm -hmm. You can see the difference when you ride in it, you feel it and you can see the numbers that are different. Yeah. So when people say you need the tender spring to avoid losing your ride height, that is almost never the case. No, we um, have actually had firsthand experience in this now because as we said, we have not changed a spring of mine and mine has zero sag. And we can do a fun little demonstration for you if you would like. Yeah, I think we've talked enough showing this, we're probably yep. good to go and yep. go and do that demonstration. Let me bring the number device because again, <laughs> numbers don't lie. I don't want you to see this on camera and think it's just our opinion and there's no facts. This is straight facts, it's measured. If you don't measure it, then you can't prove it. Yeah. So we're gonna measure from the floor to the bottom of this hitch. It's like 19 inches roughly. Yeah. We're not going to like the eighth of an inch here. We're just yeah. going in general. Approximate. So I'm not gonna be able to do So that. this is gonna be a two person job. I'm sorry if the filming isn't great. Maybe we should uh, put it on the tripod. No, I got this. Yeah. I'll figure it out. So. I so I'm gonna jump up on there and I'm gonna squish it down. Uh, it's about 18 and a half. Okay. Or no, 17 and a half, sorry. It went down to about 17 and a half. And then what did it come back up to? Well, it came back up to 19. Almost. Almost, yeah. practically. So it went down almost an inch and a half and it came back up almost an inch and a half. So this is factory springs with 200 PSI of nitrogen in the shocks. Now the next thing I want you to do is you hold this here and I'm gonna drain the nitrogen. And we're gonna see if that goes down. Moment, wait. Let me focus here. Oh, we're at 18 and a half. Can you press the shutter button so it focuses? Half press? Don't full press? Can you do it? No. Gotta. Hold, yep. So we're currently at 18 and a half. That's one shock. So just emptying both shocks, we have dropped a full inch. And that's without the vehicle moving or anything. And then if I step on it, whew, we're down to 15 and a half. And it comes back up to 17. And it was going up to almost 19. Yeah. So the argument on the internet is nitrogen is an inert stable gas and it has no effect on spring rates and spring pressures. And if you understand how springs work, then you, you would not argue and say that nitrogen matters. Well, nitrogen does matter. This is gonna get into the next video of how the shock internals work, how the IFP and the reservoir works, 
what the pressure of the gas does, pressure spikes in the gas during compression and extension, it does play an insane amount with the preload and the springs. That nitrogen gas that's in that shock is trying to extend that shock shaft at all times. And maybe we will go back over there and do another video. Let's walk back over there. Let's do that. <laughs> I'm going to climb up on the table so that I don't scratch this brand new nice little over. I'm going to use this towel. This shock, brand new, is charged at 200 psi. Okay? <laughs> so I'm almost 200 pounds. There's 200 pounds in the shock. Yeah. You're telling me the nitrogen plays no effect on the KRX's sagging, let alone any side by side sagging. It's the springs. The springs mm -hmm. are no good. Well, I've shown you the numbers. The springs are stiffer than the aftermarket. We've shown you it dropping by taking the nitrogen. Now I'm showing you what pushing on a shock with nitrogen charge, how long it takes to go down. <laughs> now watch. It looks like a really boring pogo stick. <laughs> it's slow. Well, this is a DSC shock, so I could loosen this off. Let's do that. Oh. There you go. No, it's already fully loose. So oh, boy. I'll show okay. you. So these, this is a dual compression speed shock. KRXs are just LSC, low speed compression. But if I crank these in, show you how the adjusters play a role. So now it's on firm. <laughs> yeah, it ain't going nowhere. It doesn't even move, okay? Now, so that's without the spring supporting it at all. No springs. No springs. You're only controlling how much oil can leave the shock body because it's being displaced by this shaft. Think of your fist going in a bowl full of water. Okay. If you put your fist in the bowl, where does the water go? Up. Overflows. Mm -hmm. Well, if this shaft goes inside this body, that oil needs to leave. If you tighten these down, it's like a needle that's tapered, think of that, going in a hole or putting your thumb over the end of a garden hose. If you crank these closed and you close up that garden hose, you're limiting the oil that can leave here and go into here against the nitrogen pressure. You're pushing that pressure the further I push, the higher the pressure gets. That's why it takes longer to compress it as I'm leaning on this thing. Yep. Plays a huge role. Okay. So now? Now, I take and I drop this pressure. That's good. That's enough. This wants to be all the way. It's fine. These are back to loose like the first couple times I tried it. Now there's no pressure in it. <laughs> oh, and it doesn't even come back up. What's that? I said it doesn't even come back up. It can't. Oh, because there's, the oh, the nitrogen thing. isn't pushing back on it. Oh. You don't really understand how these things work. Oh. That's the next thing. The nitrogen is always trying to push on the internal floating piston or the IFP. So if you lose that pressure, externally not internally because it can bleed by internally yeah if you lose it externally your your machine krx polaris it don't matter yeah it's going to lose your eye height it's going to say because that pressure that's trying to extend the shock at all times under it's now gone psi is gone and you're solely relying on the spring rate but when companies calculate their spring rates whether it's kawasaki can am polaris or aftermarket suppliers like the ones i showed they calculate the spring rates with 200 psi of nitrogen in the shock. Mm. So it doesn't matter what springs you have, if you lose that pressure that's assisting the spring, you're going to lose your ride height. Your spring is going to quote unquote sag, which is what. Because ah. It's losing, it's losing its help. Ah. This is super, super, super important. And that's why everyone needs to have their shock serviced all the time. Yeah. Because you don't even really know over six months or a year or a year and a half or two years if this has lost, let's just say it only lost 30 pounds. You might have lost a half inch of ride height. Your spring hasn't set. Spring technology, it's people, oh, it's a cheap Chinese spring or it's a good spring. Yeah, okay, the cheap springs will snap right in half. It, the sagging springs is kind of a hogwash. It's nitrogen pressures. Yeah. So you need to send your shocks in to your favorite guy, whoever that is, local or far away. Pick someone you like who knows their stuff. Send them in. They'll rebuild them. They'll charge them back up. Everything will be ready to go. Because 
Because, yeah, people are having problems almost direct from factory yeah, with this. that's yeah. a whole other problem because yeah. these are built on an assembly line and time is money. When I worked in the manufacturing industry, everything is on a line and you have 30 seconds to your job. It's got to go down the line to the next guy. So, like, bleeding the air out of the oil side of the shock actually takes a lot of time here. It takes a lot of effort. You can't just slap this shock together, close it up, hit it with nitrogen, and go out. You have to make sure all the air is out of the shock so that it doesn't cavitate. Cavitating is when the oil is bubbling, but we're going to get into all that <laughs> side of this on another video. This yeah. video, if we covered everything, the nitrogen was the last I wanted to just touch on it, yeah. which is the pressure and how you can lose it externally. It can leak out and this would happen, or you can lose it internally, but then this wouldn't happen quite the same as this. I'm not going to take a shock apart and replicate an internal leak because <laughs> that's a lot of labor. Yeah. But you can also have it bypass inside and mix in the oil and it will also do some funky things. When is it that it happens when a shock essentially turns into a bomb? Is that the nitrogen leaking? Yes, internally. Oh, okay. So when you take and let the nitrogen out of this valve, if you hear that piston go and hit this top cap and it's under pressure against that top cap, then when you try to open this shock, it can be a bomb. But a shock with an external reservoir, it's never going to be a bomb because yep. you can crack this hose loose and just bleed it off of here. But oils can uh, go everywhere. If you it's going to be a messy day. If you have a shock like a Fox 2.0 on a Jeep or something like that, where the piston is actually inside the shock body and it goes to the top and then you have to get the seal head out, oh, they'll hit the ceiling at 20 feet up and it could kill Jeez. you. It's, it's a wild time. So yeah. that's never fun. Yeah. But that's an internal leak. Okay. So all that stuff will be on another video. So I think we hit everything. Crossover, yeah. preload, calculating your spring rates, combined spring rate to the tender, to the main, measuring them. We proved it on the back of your machine that it'll sag without the nitrogen. I jumped on it and I proved it. Yeah. Uh, do you want to go over how to set, like, do you want to talk suspension setup and telling people, like, from factory when you get these machines, if you yes. want to improve them? what we can do and like yes. kind of like a, a cheap like essentially free mod for your brand new krx yes that, that that's good now that we've yeah. gone over all the data let's pick a machine and we'll go over it um should we go off yours yep sure. yeah it's got the stock springs so so yeah this is still the factory springs so the rule of thumb that kind of everyone's been agreeing on on the internet is that you don't want your axle shaft angles greater than 15 degrees at ride height. Um, some guys will want them completely flat if they're not really into rock crawling and it's more desert, but if ground clearance is an issue, you're gonna want a little bit more. Just try to stay below the 15 degrees. Um, you're gonna want to zoom in into this. I'm gonna need light so we can all see or something here. Okay. Can you see everything in here? Well, I think so. I'll use this as a pointer. So you got your preload rings up here. If you have your factory springs and everything, I would I would just set your preload rings to achieve the ride height that you're trying to achieve, keeping the axles under 15 degrees. Um, but I wouldn't even bother setting those until you've got your nitrogen pressures correctly. So on Mel's machine, these are the factory caps. I've just machined them and put trader valves in them. That's a service we offer and you could get those done in multiple places. It's cheaper than buying full caps like on my machine. It has the aftermarket caps and it does the exact same thing. So once you know you have 200 pounds of nitrogen in this, well, that depends on the machine. They're not all 200 pounds. Cowies, 200 pounds. Once you have that set, Set your ride height with your preloads to whatever it is that you want it to be. And then after that, you're gonna to go to your crossover rings. So you set your crossover rings after you've driven it forward and backward and everything's settled and everything's comfy and good to go on flat ground. On the front, I like to keep them between one inch and an inch and a half from this isolator. So that means the isolator can move up one inch to one and a half inches before the tender is basically removed from the equation and you're gonna be riding solely on your main spring. Okay. And then on the rear, yours has no nitrogen now, so it's sitting really low. <laughs> um, 
on the rear, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to put your nitrogen in, 200 pounds. You're going to set your ride height, your preload, and then I like to run the rear crossover at one and a half to two inches from the isolator. Okay. And then on the clickers on the Kawasaki, I like to leave all the clickers on completely soft. And that will be another thing that a lot of people on the internet say, oh, well, I have my clickers always stiff and when I hit jumps, it bottoms out. I'm about 95% sure you don't have the right amount of nitrogen in it because these things on full soft, we can send them pretty high through the air. Factory springs. <laughs> we have. With a lot softer valving than factory and they're not bottoming out. Yeah. So, you saw how easy that shock was to bottom out when I took the nitrogen out of it. Yeah. Imagine this machine with no nitrogen in it, and then you go off a jump. Well, it's got nothing in it now. It's just oh, you super soft. Talk it'll, about whiplash, man. It'll just bottom out. Yeah. So most people's problems, whether it's Polaris, k &M, or any of them, it's going to be the nitrogen. And then the other thing, we'll just quickly touch on this because I just had a chat with a guy about this. Um, dual rate spring kits on some machines versus others. So the Kawasaki actually has a pretty good true dual rate, the tender and the main. They both get used. There is room for the isolator to slide up and down. You can tune it in, but on the older machines, like um, a lot of the players, razors and stuff, some of the other machines as well, the top tender spring is what we would call coil bind right from the factory. So each layer of the spring is resting on top of itself. So it's just like a giant chunk of steel and there's no room for it to compress. And there's actually no crossover rings on the shock body either. Mm. So it looks like a dual rate setup, but it's not. So all the companies that came out with the dual rate spring kits, those machines benefit drastically because mm. you get that soft spring rate for the majority and then when it gets up to the ring and jumps to the lower it gets stiff but factory you're only ever riding on the lower say it's a 300 pound spring so even on the little bumps you're taking 300 pounds of energy to go over those little bumps so a lot of them are like bucking and like skating mm. and they're kind of hard to control and stuff yeah they don't have that soft rate for the first little bit of motion on it so okay. if you have a machine that is set up like that with like the collapsed um, full coil bind on the tenders, great upgrade. Do the spring kits, get the crossover rings, talk to someone who knows what they need, to, like they know about the shocks and they can get, guide you through it and talk you through it. Get it dialed in so that it rides right. But on these machines and a lot of the new ones that have dual rates with adjusters and everything, I think a lot of it's marketing. I do. Yeah. I think these companies are making tons of money on stuff that's not really needed. Yeah. The numbers are there. The proof is in the pudding. Yep. These springs are stiffer than the ones I put on mine. Um, this ride's amazing. That ride's amazing. It's I just, again, preference. It's preference. It's like, cause what, like he said, I don't like the way his handles because it is so tippy. I find it harder to feel that tip over point where because mine is more stiff, I feel like I can feel if I'm getting on the edge of my driving a little easier. Yep. Personally. But he likes his because he comes from Ultra 4 and he loved his car floaty and that was how you used to ride it. It's, it's hard to explain. Yeah, it's not, it's not stiff or soft. It's, it's like floaty in the corner. Like it's all to do with body roll. Yeah. Springs have a lot to do with body roll, but when I hear someone say stiff or soft, I think of like hitting potholes and it's stiff or soft, oh, not yeah. like just leany and floaty in the corners. And that's going to come from a soft, long spring with a lot of preload because it's so soft and it takes just a little bit of energy to compress it that much more. When you go to turn, it really just leans into the corners where if you have a stiff spring with less preload, it's going to take more energy to compress it that next little bit. Yeah. You can put the same valving in both, so when you're driving straight and you both hit that same bump, that valving's gonna allow both of them to be pretty smooth over those bumps. Yeah, but again, what we were saying was it comes down to personal preference. It does, yeah. it does. And if you have one of the aftermarket spring kits and you love it and you feel like it did everything you wanted it to do, then... That's great. Fantastic. Just ignore this yeah. video, yeah. it doesn't apply yeah. to you. <laughs> but hopefully you learned something. Um, uh, next time, or if you want to see a video about the internals and you're more curious about the tuning of inside of coilovers, uh, drop a comment below 
and it is officially winter for us here in Ontario. Um, so <laughs> we will be doing a lot of content. So if there's anything else you want to see, let us know and we'll whip it together. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and maybe you'll watch the next video. Yeah. Hope you, you found this informative. Yeah. What do you think, Dixie? Do you think everyone should watch just for you? Oh, you're a little too close. You're a little too close. <laughs> yeah, till next time. See you guys.